Okay, let's start. Hello everyone, and welcome to this second quantum computing webinar. My name is Jami Rönkö, and I'm from the Science Support Group. This time I'll be talking about special kind of quantum computing called quantum annealing. This recording will be recorded, and it can be viewed within a week from CSC's YouTube page. Feel free to ask any questions, and I'll answer them either during the webinar or them at the end. In the last webinar, we discussed quantum computing in general, but mainly from the point of view of the so-called gate model, universal quantum computers. The gates refer to a distinct operations that are performed one after another to the quantum computer. Universal means basically that the computer can do any kinds of calculations like the computers we are used to. Now, if you have followed any news about quantum computers, you might have heard of quantum annealers or a company called D-Wave. Quantum annealers are different from the gate-based quantum computers in that they only perf perform one kind of calculation. Normal computers and gate model quantum computers run algorithms to solve problems, but quantum annealers actually let the nature solve the problem for them. Basically, what is done is that the quantum system that is the processor of the quantum annealer is allowed to relax to an optimal energy state under constraints that represent the problem that is to be solved. Because there is no much external control over the computation, but the quantum mechanics and energy conversation principle are allowed to do the work. Uh, these quantum annealers are easier to build and scale up than gate model quantum computers. They are also not so sensitive to errors. The errors might lead to a bit less optimal solution, but they don't ruin the whole calculation, as can be with the gate-based quantum computing. As a drawback though, quantum annealers are restricted to solving optimization problems and related things such as sampling. Let's start unraveling the quantum annealing concept by seeing where the term annealing comes from. In metallurgy, annealing is a long-known heat treatment method that increases the ductility and reduces the hardness of a metal, making it easier to mold. Annealing is a two-step process. First, a piece of metal is heated to high temperatures above its recrystallization temperature. Beyond the recrystallization temperature, the atomic bonds of the metal break and the atoms start to move around. Now, ideally the atoms are fixed in a perfect crystal lattice, but in reality there is always some defects and suboptimal configurations. These are relieved as the atoms are set free by the high temperature. The second step of the annealing is just letting the metal cool down back to the room temperature. Because this cooling happens in a slow and smooth way, the atoms are likely to form an optimal minimum tension, minimum energy crystal lattice when they cool down and settle on their place. Now let's move from metallurgy to computer algorithms. It was realized in 1980s that the algorithms used to solve optimization problems, like the famous Monte Carlo methods, could, at least in some cases, benefit from this idea of decreasing heat vibrations. As a quick introduction, Monte Carlo optimization algorithms are probabilistic methods that start from some initial guess solution, then randomly change the value of the solution candidate repeatedly, and hopefully reach an optimal solution in the end after many steps. You can visualize this process as a point moving in a landscape of hills and valleys that corresponds to the values of the function whose largest, whose largest or smallest value is being searched. It is important that the algorithm sometimes moves to the direction of worse solutions in order to find even better solutions beyond them. As a metaphor, you sometimes need to climb a hill to get to a low valley beyond it. So this was the conventional Monte Carlo optimization algorithm. Now the idea of simulated annealing is to progressively decrease the probability of the algorithm moving into the worse solutions. 
So essentially, the algorithm first moves widely from one solution candidate to another, but then starts to to less and less starts to do less and less radical changes as the so-called temperature parameter decreases. Here you can see animation show, showing how simulated annealing algorithm looks for the highest value of some messy function. The red line shows the value of the function during each step as the algorithm runs. At the high temperature parameter, the algorithm probes many far off values, but as the temperature decreases, it is only doing some fine tuning near one peak that luckily seems to be the highest value of this function. Mm, the probability that optimization algorithm, algorithm updates its current state to some other state depends on the cost or energy barrier between these states. The algorithms take this model from classical physics where objects need to have enough energy to cross barriers. Take for example a ball rolling over a hill. In the 90s, Japanese physicists came up with an idea of using quantum fluctuation instead of these classical thermal fluctuations to drive these transitions in the annealing algorithms. As seen in this figure, unlike the thermal fluctuations that can push the state over an energy barriers, quantum algorithms don't cause the system to cross the barriers, but rather just make them appear on the other side of them. This is called quantum tunneling. Uh, and for quantum fluctuations, the, the height of the barrier doesn't matter that much as, for the, as it does for the thermal fluctuations. The width of the barrier, that is how close the other state is, however, affects whether a quantum transition happens or not. Because of this feature, quantum fluctuations might perform better in, in some cases where the function has some high but thin energy barriers, which might be too high for the thermal fluctuations. In these cases, the quantum fluctuation guns could still tunnel through just by appearing on the other side like this. However, simulating this quantum fluctuation is more com computationally expensive than using the thermal fluctuation model. But if one could build appropriate quantum system, these fluctuations would not be simulated, but actually happen physically. Now, there is a Canadian quantum company, quantum computing company, D-Wave system, that has chosen to do quantum annealing, which makes it different from the other quantum computing companies. D-Wave realizes the quantum annealing on a lattice of physical qubits whose total energy as a function of the qubit configuration or qubit state is made to correspond to the landscape of the problem that is being optimized. The main part of the quantum annealer is the quantum processing unit seen here in the middle. In the current version of the D-Wave 2000Q, the quantum processor holds 2048 qubits. To maintain the delicate quantum properties of the processing unit, it has to be isolated in 15 millikelvin degrees in a high vacuum and be protected from physical vibrations and electromagnetic fields. This is why the whole quantum annealer system looks like this big black box you can see on the left here. Let's take a closer look at the individual qubits of the D-Waves annealer. Like in the most uh, leading quantum computers, the D-Wave's qubits are made of small superconducting loops. In such a quantum mechanical loop, a tiny constant current can run either clockwise or counterclockwise. And as you might remember from the right-hand rule, counterclockwise current induces upward magnetic field and clockwise current induce, induces downward magnetic field. Because of these two possible states, the superconducting loop is an optimal qubit to carry binary information. Now, how can the quantum fluctuations be introduced and controlled in this system as is needed for the annealing method? It is done by activating an external magnetic field that is a 90 degrees angle to the qubit's own magnetic field. Just like a compass needle 
in a magnetic field, this, this qubit field would like to align itself with the external field. But since the qubit is a quantum system whose field can only point up or down, something more interesting happens. The qubit goes into a superposition state where its magnetic field kind of points both up and down at the same time. When the external field is switched off, the superposition goes back to a classical state of magnetic field pointing either up or down. Consider now the whole lattice of qubits. If the external magnetic field is off, the qubits remain in some fixed configuration, some of them pointing up and some pointing down. When the external field is switched on, all the qubits go into the superposition state and the whole lattice will be in an undetermined state. This is a quantum analogy of the metal from the second slide being really hot with its atoms moving wildly around. Before I show how a quantum annealer solves an optimization problem, let's see how one inputs some give some problem to the annealer. Because of the way the qubits are connected and how they can be controlled, the D-Wave's quantum annealer sol solves only quadratic, quadratic unconstrained binary optimization problems, that is QBOs. The annealer tries to find the minimum value for this kind of QBO function by finding the best qubit configuration, that is these, va these Q values under constraints that are in this function, this a's and b's. Now the QBO function has two kinds of terms. First are the bias terms, where each qubit is given some weight, a. The positive weights try to pull the qubit to be zero, and the negative weights try to pull them to be one. Second kind of terms the uh, QBO have are these kind of coupler terms, where you see this b variable, that is a coupler that affects whether a qubit prefers to have the same value as its neighbor. So to program a quantum annealer, the user just has to give the values of a's and b's that correspond to the constraints of his or her optimization problem. The annealer then runs the quantum annealing process and outputs, outputs the solution in a form of binary sequence of the bit values q's. Let's now have a look at what happens to the qubits during the annealing. Here is an energy diagram showing the energies of the different qubit configurations. At the start of the annealing, the external trans transverse magnetic field B is switched on. This light blue mist that you can see on the diagram implies that the qubits are not in any single definite state, but in a superposition where all possible qubit states are present equally and have the same energy. This is an example of a quantum parallelism and the first difference to the simulated annealing, where the algorithm has to start from one definite state. Second difference to simulated annealing is that at this point in the quantum annealing, the problem landscape is just a straight line. To start the annealing, the external magnetic field is being reduced. And at the same time, the qubit biases and couplings are being turned on. So the two things happen at the same time. The shape of the problem landscape, landscape begins to emerge and the superposition begins to become unequal so that the states having lower energy start to have higher weights in the superposition. This development continues as B decreases and the problem landscape becomes clearer. This process of superposition becoming concentrated on the valleys of the energy landscape happens naturally since the state of the qubits, qubit lattice follows the Schrodinger equation. That is like a quantum version of the new Newton's equation of motion. The qubits are just allowed to relax under the changing magnetic field, magnetic conditions. And at this point, the special nature of quantum tunneling helps to shift the superposition towards the states with minimal energy. At the end of the annealing, the external field is gone to zero and the superposition is turned into a well-defined single state, hopefully at the deepest valley of the energy landscape, 
that best satisfies the biases and couplings. And now, because the biases and couplings correspond to the constraints of some real optimization problem, then this end state actually decodes the optimal solution of the problem. And a nice feature here is that all this happens in only a, a few microseconds. Okay, now that we have gone through the technique of the quantum annealing, let's briefly look at what it is used for in, in the real world. D-Wave has sold actual physical quantum annealers to Lockheed Martin, Google and NASA, and Los Alamos National Laboratory. Many more institutions and companies use the annealers located in Canada via internet. Indeed, many commercial companies are trying out the quantum annealing as alternative to classical methods and to prepare for the future. Same as with other quantum computers, these quantum annealers are still not at the level where they would greatly outperform classical supercomputers though. However, they are at the moment more useful than the con conventional gate-based quantum computers because they have much more qubits available and are more tolerant to errors. The real-world applications of quantum annealing can be divided into three categories. Firstly, the real optimization problems themselves, like scheduling transport routes, or in general, just finding the most efficient ways of doing any complicated multi-option task. Many users use quantum annealing to speed up machine learning, which is especially suitable application because it doesn't suffer that much from noisy da data. And though the quantum annealer's data could be somewhat noisy, it is produced very fast. And the last group of applications is material simulation, that is facing problems when simulating exotic quantum materials with just classical computers. And just to give an idea of what is being done, here are some quantum annealing projects from the D-Wave's latest users conference. Traffic optimization seemed to be a very hot topic since flight gate assignment was done by DLR, route optimization for Japanese transport by Denso, and allocation of Italian railway traffic by Data Reply and FSI. Then BMW was optimizing robotic movement in manufacturing in their car factories. And GE Research was looking into optimizing, optimizing asset sustainment. A new startup company Peptone was studying the behavior of proteins. Vuxi Nextcode Genomics was using the D-Wave to do classification of cancer data. And Oti Lumionics company was doing quantum chemistry which is basically a material research with the quantum annealer. One quite good example of what many, co many companies are using the D-Wave's quantum annealer for is this Volkswagen's project from 2017. These people wanted to optimize the taxi traffic between Beijing, Beijing Center and airport. The D-Wave system could handle 418 taxis for each of which it considered three possible routes. The annealing would then decide which route each taxi should take in order to minimize the total congestion on the roads. As is the current situation with quantum annealing, the results were okay, but nothing too amazing that uh, classical computers couldn't have done. The qubit number and connectivity is still limiting quantum annealers to kind of small, small scale problems. As a final example, I'll talk a bit about what CSC has been doing with the D-Waves machine. CSC bought computing time to the D-Waves annealer to conduct a joint research with Boston University, Aalto University and Oppo Academy. The idea is to study the behavior of the qubit lattice of the quantum processing unit itself, not use it to solve any external problems. Uh, the working of the qubit lattice is actually under the hood based on a physical model called Easing model. Easing model is basically a way of describing a magnet as a collection of smaller magnets or spins. We want to find out how well the qubit lattice of D-Wave actually agrees with the theoretical two-dimensional Easing model. 
in order to do this, the two-dimensional icing spin lattice, that is a lattice of spins who are each interacting with their nearest neighbors, has to be mapped into the qubit lattice of D-Wave. The qubits are not connected to all of their nearest neighbors. Rather, the lattice is formed of these kind of unit cells, where each qubit is only connected to half other qubits in the, in the same cell and two qubits in the name neighboring unit cells. The question of how to embed one's problem onto the qubit lattice is often a big part of the work that one needs to do in order to solve problems with the quantum annealer. In this case, it's rather straightforward, but still illuminating. Here on the left is eight spins from the easing lattice, properly connected to their neighbor, neighbors. On the right is four unit cells of the qubit lattice. In order to realize the nearest neighbor connections in the qubit lattice, each spin has to be represented by a pair of qubits. This is done by creating a strong coupling between the qubits that will force them to end up having the same value after the annealing. For example, the spin number one on the right will be mapped to these two qubits on the left that you can see as red dots. And then the spin number two will be will be mapped to these two blue dots, blue qubits, and spin number three will be this green pair here, and four will be these yellow ones. Uh, and for these neighboring B unit cells, the mapping has to be done in a kind of mirror image to properly make the embedding match the easing lattice. Easing lattice. Um, and in this easing problem, we only use these qubit couplings, inter-qubit couplings B, and set all the qubit biases to zero, so that each spin will be treated equally during the annealing. So this is kind of a simple problem, but nonetheless interesting. Then, once we understand the logic of the embedding, we just give corresponding coupling values to the annealer. We set we set big negative coupling values for the qubits that are chained as the same spin, and smaller negative values for the couplings that corresponds the spin-spin interactions in the easing model. The negative spin-spin coupling means that we are modeling a ferromagnet here. A ferromagnet is in the lowest relaxed energy state when all the spins are pointing in the same way. When we start to anneal this system, in the beginning, the external magnetic field is high and all the spins are in disordered state. Then, as the annealing is done and the magnetic field is driven to zero, the spins will settle down to the minimum energy state, all pointing in the same direction. We try this for different sized spin lattices and with different annealing times, and calculate the magnetization of the end states. Here on this figure, you see that if the annealing is done too quickly, in less than up about 10 microseconds, the system does not reach perfect ferromagnetic state. That corresponds to here, the magnetization being one. But that some of the spins end up pointing in the opposite direction, which reduces the total magnetization. This is a manifestation of the known fact that the annealing has to be done slow, slow enough to reach the optimal solution. However, what is new here is that we are looking at the end state magnetization's dependence of the lattice size that can yield interesting new insights to the physics inside the D-Wave machine. Uh, this brings to the end of the webinar. And just to highlight some main points, I'll conclude with remarking that uh, Quantum annealers solve optimization problems by translating them into a specific quantum hardware that runs an annealing process. And though quantum annealers are in theory not as capable as conventional gate model quantum computers can be, they are currently leading the race in terms of performance and customers. Especially with many companies trying quantum annealing, D-Wave is building a user base earlier than other quantum companies quantum computing companies, which might turn out decisive in the future. Companies are solving their optimization and scheduling problems with D-Wave's annealer for proof of concept, 
mostly. The current size of the quantum processing unit, that is 2048 qubits, still limits the performance. So there is still no clear demonstration that D-Wave outperforms classical supercomputers. D-Wave is, however, planning to publish a new version in 2020 that has more than 5,000 qubits and increased qubit connectivity. As a last point, I'll mention that D-Wave actually gives everyone free one minute runtime on their annealer. And they have nice instructions, tools, and demo demos on their site. I recommend checking it out. And if you want to learn more about quantum annealing, and, and you can also try it out yourself there. OK, thank you for listening. And if there's any questions, I'll answer them now. Okay, no questions. Well, thanks for listening and you can view this later from YouTube. Yep, thank you.